Yes, I can. Oh, courting. So welcome, St. Andrews. Welcome to our uh, Sunday by Zoom, of course, uh, fifth Sunday of Easter, May the 10th, 2020. Uh, it's a great morning to be with you. Uh, let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship this day. And of course, on a day like today, uh, there's some virtual flowers for all those, uh, all those who are our mothers, those who are remembering their mothers, uh, and those, many of those who are mother figures to us in our in our daily living. A happy Mother's Day to all today. And it's a very strange day to be celebrating Mother's Day as uh, this is often a time when uh, people get together with their, their mothers and their families and uh, have an opportunity to be thankful and grateful for uh, mothers in our lives. So uh, for those of you who are, are missing that, um, you know, we certainly will keep you in prayer today. And uh, maybe there's ways that you can still share connections with mothers who are with us uh, to be able to do that too. And certainly prayers for those who are remembering uh, mothers who've passed. So be with us all today, we pray as we gather in worship and let us come together. And this is our call to worship. And I'd invite you to join in the bold print uh, in your spaces. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was. Here and now among us, beside us, enlisting the people of the earth for purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we have turned to dust and all we know has found its fulfillment, God will be. Not denying the world, but delighting in it. Not condemning the world, but redeeming it through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. God was... God is, and God will be. Let us worship God. Let us pray. In you, O gracious God, the, the widowed find a carer, the orphaned find a parent, the fearful find a friend. In you, the wounded find a healer, the penitent find a pardoner, and the burdened find a counselor. In you, the miserly find a beggar, the despondent find a laughter maker, and the legalists find a rule breaker. In you, Jesus Christ, we meet our match. We meet our maker. We meet our creator. And if some need, need to say, help me, and if some need to say, save me, and if some need to say, hold me, and if some need to say, forgive me, then let those be said now in confidence by us in the silence of this moment. O Christ, in whose heart is both welcome and warning, say to us, do to us, reveal within us the things that will make us whole. And we will wait and we will praise you. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning does come from the book of Lamentations that we're going to be sitting with for the next three weeks. And we're looking at the first two chapters today. So our first readings for this morning come from Lamentations chapter one, the first few verses, and then Lamentations chapter two, the first few verses of that poem as well. So let us listen for the word of God. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. And she weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters. Her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. 
They fled without strength before the pursuer. How the Lord in his anger has humiliated daughter Zion. He has thrown down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. As he has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has destroyed without mercy all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in his fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand from them in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy. With his right hand set like a foe, he has killed all in whom we took pride in the tent of daughter Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has destroyed Israel. He has destroyed all its palaces, laid in ruins its strongholds, and multiplied in daughter Judah mourning and lamentation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. God who raises more questions than answers, we come to you this day wondering what to say. Mindful of what we've been taught, scolded possibly for having a thought, a doubt, a curiosity, an opposing view. Yet you hold all of what we offer in your vulnerable and scarred hands. You keep them open, and you remain open, so that we can be our fully human selves, whom those same hands have crafted and called good. May we hear your word today, even in what you leave unspoken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, St. Andrews, and I, I am aware that I am taking a bit of a risk today. I'm stepping into uncharted waters, but such a time as this seems to call me forth. It goads me on. And so today I begin what I'm calling a, a three-part sermon series on Lamentations, uh, a book that's rarely spoken of, maybe because of its raw emotion, maybe because of its unrelenting outcry against the divine, or its violent imagery, not typically welcomed in the sanctity of the Sunday morning. But that moves me to begin this series with a bit of a warning. The Book of Lamentations is hard to read. It's incredibly difficult to bear witness to the anguish of its protagonist and to take in the comprehensive, unremitting, descriptive narrative of trauma inflicted upon an ancient people as their city their temple, their very lives, their livelihood are disrupted and violated and devastated and left in absolute ruins by a foreign occupier. Certainly reader discretion is strongly advised and be kind to yourself as you read its poetry. And maybe I'd also say that because ancient people, patriarchal types for sure, and maybe the same is true today, often use women as the victims in such stories of brutality and violence. Now, they, they'd likely argue it's to elicit sympathy or pathos, but too often we've learned that this kind of practice can have the opposite effect. So it really bears noting, it, it needs to be said that the Book of Lamentations perpetuates the blaming and shaming of women. It's a topic that's been has reemerged recently as acts of violence have been framed as being instigated by something that a woman did to possibly trigger a man, a jilted partner. And it's so often normalized in our culture as we assume that a woman must have done something or didn't do something or acted or dressed or deserved maltreatment by a man. And this is unacceptable. It needs to be named. It needs to be changed in our culture. And so I believe in the same way I do when we come across anti-Semitism in our scriptures, that misogyny of any kind must be called out. It must be challenged. All human beings, 
created in the image of God must be treated with respect. And violence against any human being in all its forms is intolerable. And those who perpetrate it must, must be held accountable. No matter if they are in office or running for office or working from their home office. Now, having opened in this way, you might be saying, well, why, why would you even talk about this book in the Bible? It is so depressing. It's so tragic. It's so heartbreaking. It's far too graphic for us to talk about in church, even if it's church through Zoom. And aren't we facing enough challenges right now, Reverend John? I mean, I, I don't know why you'd even bring this book up. There's supposed to be some good news here today. Well, believe me, I hear you. I've heard you. I do. And so let me maybe start this sermon series by offering a bit of my why in brief of where we're going over the next few weeks. So why would I even decide to talk about Lamentations? Well, I believe that the Book of Lamentations can give us a kind of a framework, a place, a container, a, maybe even a shelter, if you will, to safely place our own distress, our frustration, our abandonment, maybe our questions and our doubts, our despair and our, our sometimes feelings of hopelessness that we may be feeling even as we live through COVID. I also believe that as we bear witness to the pain of another, that we can find solace for those pains that we find within ourselves and stand in solidarity with one another as we grasp for hope. And speaking of hope, this, this poetic quintet paints a very interesting picture of what real hope looks like. And we'll discover that together. And finally, I'm, I'm deeply curious to explore the, the typically clear of who's to, pl who's to blame game that's often found in the scriptures. It's often a question, who's to blame for all of this? And Lamentations, in my opinion, plays this game very differently. And I'd like, to, I'd like to push that out for us even further for our consideration. But that's not for today. That'll be in a couple weeks. So that's where we're going. But, but let me begin by locating us, locating the text in its context. Not surprisingly, scholarship is divided about who, is, who has written these poems and, and when they were even penned. But it would seem given the context of all the things around it, that they were written by someone who had experienced the destruction of Jerusalem, likely during what is referred to as the, the Babylonian conquest, which occurred around 586 BCE or before the common era or before Christ, depending on how you were taught history. And for the sake of brevity and to catch us up, let me, let me give us a little bit of a glimpse of, of where the story of God as outlined in the Hebrew scriptures has, has gone from here to there. So the people of the ancient Near East who lived in the region near Jerusalem, what we would call modern day Israel, during the time of Lamentations were ancestors of the people of Israel who cried out to God some 600 years earlier as they were enslaved in Egypt. The story goes that God heard their cries and delivered them and led them through the leadership of Moses on an exodus to the promised land where they reside for centuries. Sadly, not in peace generally, it seems that other peoples and other empires sought to control and to conquer this promised land. I mean, it is a land flowing with milk and honey after all, so why not have it for your very own? Now, as we understand it, the Assyrian Empire does do so at some point. And then come the Babylonians who conquer the Assyrians. And, and next will come the Persians who will conquer the Babylonians. And, and so on, and so on, and so on. But back to where we are talking about today. It seems, and, and this is detailed in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25, that the Babylonians conquered this area initially and, and sent all those whom they didn't kill into exile to their capital city, not surprisingly named Babylon. And they did leave behind a remnant, it says, the, the poorest people in the land, the text says, to reap the resources and, and send it back to fuel that empire. 
Now they set up a, a puppet king and all seemed well for a few verses until there was a rebellion. The people revolted. Empires don't like rebellions. They don't like revolutions. And unfortunately, in the history of the city of Jerusalem, it will experience the brunt of this truth, not just once, but twice in its long history. One coming not long after the time of Jesus, as Jerusalem is, is speared in the heart by the Roman Empire. But this one is the first. The Babylonian Empire puts down the re rebellion brutally. It murders the royal family. It kills many of its citizens. It carts the rest off to live the rest of their days by the rivers of Babylon. And oh yeah, of course, the invaders desecrate, destroy the temple. The very temple in Jerusalem. The place where God was said to have lived. The one that Solomon built. But the text still reminds us that they left a remnant of the people to till the fields and tend the vines, the poorest of the people in the land. Now, Lamentations presents the pain of survivors in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem. These people had lost loved ones. They lost their entire way of life, their, their material well-being. They lost hope for the future. They, they even lost their confidence in God. In a way, the Babylonian conquest, and, and perhaps for us living in COVID, this kind of experience is, kind of, is this idea of the disappearance of everything to which one might have looked forward, in, in varying degrees, of course. These things are often relative. You know, like the life one was expecting to lead, the work one was hoping to do, the, the occasions, the events, the experiences that one was looking forward to. Well, all of that assumed story is over, but a new one has not taken its place yet. And one sometimes wonders if it ever will. And this is the very location that one finds oneself in as we sit with lamentations. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. That phrase today seems so eerily familiar to us. How? How? Now, maybe you know this already, but in the Hebrew Bible, its books are named by their opening words. So Lamentations, that we call it, is actually called the book of how. How? I wonder how could this happen? The word how gives voice to the grief of what we are about to witness. How she sits you can sense the poet's plea that we come and join her. The city who will soon be named Daughter Zion, Zion being another name for Jerusalem, sits alone, all alone, shunned and humiliated. Who will comfort her? The narrator says, there is no one to comfort her in her suffering. These opening two poems from chapter one and two build the case for what is called the lament. And laments are, are really prayers that erupt from wounds, burst out of unbearable pain. It gives words, gives a voice to one's suffering. Laments are different from, from other kinds of things. They're, laments are really about complaining and shouting and protesting. They're crying out often in anger and despair to God and to the wider community. They grieve and they argue and they find fault. But really, if there is no complaint, then there's really no lament. Lament is that kind of complaining, that kind of outrage, that kind of outcry. And traditionally, in the story of God that we find ourselves in, laments emerge from fissures in the narrative. Laments will ask tough questions, questions that sometimes we feel afraid to even ask. If God rescues, if God liberates and protects us, then how could such events occur? If God dwells with us, promises to be in a, in a covenantal relationship with us, to be our God and, and we, God's people, then, then how could these things happen? Even worse, what if God caused these things to happen? 
why did God do these things to us? What is beautiful about lament is that while many of us may be jarred by such harsh complaints to the divine, they are profound acts of fidelity and faith. In vulnerability and honesty, they cling obstinately to God, and they demand for God to see, God to hear, God to act. They express faith in God in the midst of chaos and doubt and confusion. They cry out that that life is unbearable, that suffering is too great, and that the future is hopeless. They are the prayers of the discontented, the disturbed, and the distraught. And they have a place of honor in the story of God. Indeed, they have their place in the story that is told through our lives too. Sometimes one needs to cry out. Sometimes one needs to complain even to God. And lamentation is the necessary human response to the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Now, what's interesting about the book of Lamentations is how it contains such outrage, literally. It uses this poetic style called acrostic where the the writer begins each verse with a a letter in sequence from the Hebrew alphabet which has 22 letters. So that's why there's 22 verses in each chapter, except for chapter three, where the author turns up the volume and triples the lament using that same style. What's amazing about doing so is that it contains the depth and breadth of the suffering. It contains it, it it creates order and gives it shape out of grief and despair and chaos even that could rightly just overflow and get out of control. I mean, five poems, really? For the destruction of everything they knew? Five poems for hundreds of thousands of lives lost? Five poems, that's it? But it's clever. Oh, it's clever in its symbolism because it doesn't diminish the enormity of the suffering, but instead suggests that it's infinite. For it spans the basic components of written language from beginning to end, from A to Z, as it were. And that is the kind of shelter of sorrow where one's pain can find voice and safety. And while words are necessary to express one's lament, words often fail when one seeks to comfort another laid low in suffering. You know, perhaps the best advice, like the friends of Job who sat silently with him in his grief and pain in those opening chapters of the book of Job, at least initially, the best advice might be, don't start with words. If you want to comfort someone, don't start with words. And, and if you are going to use words, fewer is better. When faced with the, the totality of another's suffering, As the narrator says in the second poem, what can I even say for you? To what compare you, O daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken that I may comfort you? For vast as the sea is your ruin, who can heal you? Before we offer explanations, before we offer our judgments, before we even offer blame, And don't worry, we're going to talk about blame in a couple of weeks. Even before we might even give voice to our own laments, the poet demands that we see, that we hear, and that we listen. Too often in our moments of deepest pain, when we most need consolation, people start talking. They start offering their own words, their unhelpful phrases that really are about seeking to to push us forward, to help us to to get over it, to, to move on with life in a way, probably for their sake, so that they're more comfortable. They mean well, but you've probably heard some of those meaningless phrases and even said them yourself at one point or another. Oh, God won't give you anything more than you can handle. Everything happens for a reason. You need to get over it and move on. 
don't, don't feel that way. Don't, you don't think that. Yes, they're intended to comfort and encourage. Words such as these do the exact opposite. They really add to rather than diminish pain. And what's even more fascinating in Lamentations is that while the poem's speakers all call, they even demand it for God to respond. God never does. God never speaks in these five poems. The stark absence of God intensifies the depth of abandonment and isolation of the lament. But it could also be said that maybe God is modeling the right action. Maybe God is honoring the voices of pain and suffering. You see, Lamentations creates that shelter of safety for sorrow because, because there is no speech from God. Further emphasizing that words must take a back seat. They must take a back seat to presence, to being with, to being on the ground. How lonely sits. And we are invited to sit on the ground beside daughter Jerusalem. To sit down beside any who are experiencing sorrow and abandonment, whether that's literally or maybe more metaphorically and figuratively in the time that we are in right now. And really, the poet's greatest desire is for someone to comfort daughter Zion, someone to, to witness, to bear witness to what she has gone through and what she has experienced and what she is experiencing even now. And maybe it's a stretch, but I'd suggest that in one way we have become her comforters. By taking, taking the time to, to sit with her today, by, by listening to her pain, her anguish, her despair, and her lament, by not just walking on by, by not shying away or, or turning from it, but simply sitting with her in the dirt. Truly, this act on our parts is the definition of empathy. And empathy, well, it has the power to heal us too. It seeks to honor our reality, our pain, our experience. By sitting with the Book of Lamentations, we honor the voices of loss and pain and despair that are an integral part of being human beings, of, of living this life we live. And it mirrors pain back to those who suffer, who, who cry out. And in that process, it brings us out of isolation into, into community, even if only briefly. As we sit with daughter Zion, we realize that we are not alone in our experience. We're not alone when we, when we feel abandoned and isolated. We're not alone when we grieve, when we're sad. We're not alone when we're confused and feeling hopeless. And yes, of course, we, we might want to wish that we could just avoid such feelings. We might want to deny our own experience, our memories, our pain. But choosing to sit for a time with daughter Zion comforts her in her anguish. And perhaps symbolically, or I hope even more literally for us, creates a recognition within ourselves that we are no longer alone in this world, carrying the messy emotional baggage we've borne for some time. And in that experience, we declare that we have heard the one who sits alone, providing comfort to the one who believed themselves abandoned. And at the very same time, we affirm our own human dignity by not denying, by not stuffing down, by, by not just ignoring our own pain reflected back in the poetry of these ancient pages. And that, I'd suggest, is a first step, a first step towards healing. And that is the power of the artistry of the Book of Lamentations.
sitting alone in the biblical canon between two prophetic pillars that almost eclipse these small little poems that are brought to life today in our own reading, alone no more, just like us, just like us, just like us. And this is good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather as a church, we of course are aware of our need to be generous, our need to offer something of ourselves, whether that's something financial or something just of a, a word or two or merely just presence in ways that we can offer that presence in this day that we're living in. We're grateful for the gifts and the generosity that have been donated to St. Andrew's Guelph and you are certainly able to continue to do that through our website uh, and post it on the order of service today for sure. And Presbyterian World Service Development continues to do uh, its good work around the globe, helping those communities that are more vulnerable and perhaps more in need in some ways without infrastructure, without supports. There's always the opportunity of the GuelphCoronavirus.ca and many different ways to participate there through that crowd sourced and crowd uh, created uh, website. And of course, our mission committee would encourage us all to consider our mission partners at this time, the generosity of so many uh, throughout the community, uh, the Guelph Community Foundation's uh, response fund that many have donated to, uh, to help support, as well as some of our own mission partners, specifically Chalmers and the Royal City Mission, the Drop-In Center, many, many more that are in need of support at this time. And, and certainly we're grateful for the, the generosity that has occurred. We heard at the beginning of our worship this morning that um, we did actually as a church community participate in the, um, in the uh, Saturday night supper that we normally would participate in. And that's been great. Um, so we, we did that last night through uh, the act of Rhonda, right? Who uh, delivered some cake and some salads to Royal City Mission last night, which is awesome. And uh, Courtright provided the main course for last night's meal. And then those meals were delivered to local hotels and, uh, and also to people who'd lined up outside of uh, Royal City Mission. So we're really grateful for all the people who continue to support our most vulnerable citizens on a regular basis. So thank you for that. And as we uh, continue to worship and gather today, let us uh, gather our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us offer some words of prayer this day. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, God who is open to our words of lament, God who is vulnerable enough to hear our cries, God who is willing to listen to whatever we might say, Hear us, we pray, on a day like today. As we consider this lowly book within your great story that is told, just five, five chapters within a, a book that is, tells your whole story in a variety of different ways. We appreciate the opportunity to be able to sit with Daughter Zion today and we acknowledge that you sit with all of us and are present with all of us in your own way. We're often aware that sometimes that presence feels fleeting, it doesn't feel as tangible as we'd want it to be. And so sometimes we need reminders of your story. Sometimes we need reminders that it's okay to cry out and to complain and to, to say, this isn't right. Hear us, listen to us, we cry. You can take it. So we offer it in this prayer today. 
We pray for all those across this globe who are continuing to, to work hard to take care of those in need during this time, during this crisis. We continue to pray for wisdom and guidance for our leaders, both in the governments and in our medical system. We're grateful for all those who continue to work in places that are necessary and essential. We ask you to continue to be with all those who do that work and then come home to family, where they share their love and concern for them as well, and while those family members are worried and concerned for them. Help them to listen to one another and to, to share that burden together. We pray for all those places in the world where people have lost loved ones or people are worried for those who are sick. We pray that in this strange time when people can't be as present as they would most desire to be, we pray that you might give a sense of your presence even deeper. That there might be a knowledge that we are never alone in the midst of our pain and our grief and our despair. Help us to know that for sure. And gracious God, we pray for many in our community who are still struggling with isolation, still wondering what tomorrow looks like and are trying to think ahead, but just aren't sure what that looks like either. Give us a sense of peace. Give us a sense that we are sheltered in your great love and compassion for the living of these days. We offer some prayers in our own community as well of, of people known to us and names that we might say that are known to us, but we know that you know all of our concerns and all our prayers before we even say them out loud. We pray gratitude for the Reverend Diane Boyd and for her, our opportunity to share with her as she, uh, she ministers at Rockwood Presbyterian Church. We're grateful to have been able to offer and present her with her robe last Sunday and wish her well as she continues to minister to those people and, and minister in our community still. We pray for some who are named this day. We pray for uh, Peter Fisher as he undergoes upcoming surgery and treatment for a cancer diagnosis. And we pray for Lynn as she offers her support and cares for him. We pray for the family and friends of, of Vera McGowan as they mourn her loss last week, last month. We pray for Marilyn Blackwood and her daughter. And we pray for Helen Mamberg as she uh, begins treatment uh, for a journey with skin cancer. We pray for Jean Bernier's dad and we pray for so many others, oh God. Many others who don't wish to be named. They like to keep their stuff private, confidential and don't want to share. We pray for them and think of them at this time as well, knowing that your love and support and compassion and healing extends to all these places that we might keep to ourselves. So be with us, we pray, as we conclude these words of prayer with a prayer taught to us by Jesus himself saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I'd offer you these words of blessing. May you now go from this screen knowing that you are blessed. You are blessed in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Go from this place to whatever that means for you, whether that's connecting with some people by phone or maybe another Zoom meeting of some kind, or maybe just being on your own with your own thoughts, finding something to entertain you with or a craft or something, whatever that looks like may you know that you are blessed and that you are a blessing. Be that blessing in this world today, for that's what this world needs, more blessings just like you.
Amen. Amen.